Unless you're really, 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 really good or, I don't know, win tough enough or something, one of the most viable routes to WWE is by acing a tryout. WWE tryouts have taken place in various forms over the years, from training camps at the Performance Center to non-televised dark matches to auditions in front of a green screen at Titan Towers. Some major names in the business, including world champions and eventual WWE Hall of Famers, have participated, only to have their hopes and dreams dashed for one reason or another. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestling stars who failed WWE tryouts. Don't call us, we'll call you. But first, who is the Diesel to your Shawn Michaels? Who is the Rhea Ripley to your Dominic Mysterio? Who is the Ralphus to your Chris Jericho? Well, Maybe not that last one. But if you want the best protection out there, there is now better than NordVPN. <laughs> Cheers to Nord for sponsoring this video. We at Cultaholic truly believe that Nord is the best service of its kind. But don't take my word for it, because Nord was actually named one of Time Magazine's 2022 Best Inventions. Gonna argue with Time, are ya? So here is how I use Nord. Obviously, I live in the United Kingdom, but with NordVPN, I can set myself to be anywhere in the world virtually and access content from those regions. So this means if I fancied it, I could set myself to be somewhere in the world virtually and sign up for a certain sports entertainment network for a fraction of the price. Or if I happen to live in the United States, I could sign up for that sports entertainment network, even though it doesn't properly exist as it did in the United States before. All of the suplexes, pile drivers, and hurricane runners you could want for a fraction of the price. Oh, and it works for plenty of other on-demand services too. There is even a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if Nord isn't for you, you can get your money back, no bother at all. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash cultaholic, link in the description below, to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus four additional months free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day a money back guarantee. Number 10, Adam Page. Prior to building his name and reputation in organizations like Ring of Honor, New Japan, and AEW, Hangman Adam Page felt as though the only way to truly make a good living in wrestling was by getting signed by WWE. Page had a WWE tryout early in his career, and unfortunately for the anxious millennial cowboy, it did not go well. After pinning all of his hopes on making the cut, Hangman was left devastated when he was passed over. Admitting years later that he fell into a sort of depression after, failing the tryout had him considering his future and whether he even wanted to pursue a professional wrestling career at all. Thankfully, the former AEW world champion was able to get out of the rut and managed to forge a fruit full career both in the United States and overseas. It must be said that when AEW came along, it was a game changer for him and many others who had participated in unsuccessful WWE tryouts. Funnily enough, Paige was actually approached by WWE in 2018, but ended up rebuffing their advances. Number 9. The Nasty Boys Alright, this one is sort of legendary, but for all the wrong reasons. The Nasty Boys were invited to the November 20th, 2007 combined SmackDown and ECW tapings because the show was taking place in their hometown of Tampa, Florida, and some of their backstage buddies had vouched for them. Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags got a really good pop coming out for their match with Dave Taylor and a young Drew McIntyre, but that is where the good news began and ended. The Nasties, who hadn't really tagged regularly since Sags left WCW in early 97, were massively overweight and worked excessively stiff with their opponents. They also played to the crowd too much and wouldn't leave the ring when instructed, infuriating WWE officials who needed to make sure that everything ran on time. Needless to say, they didn't get offered contracts. Nobbs, for his part, claimed that the match was changed around three times during the course of the afternoon, blaming Taylor, who was also an agent at the time, for sabotaging it, and questioned why they even needed a tryout in the first place. I think we already covered that part, didn't we? Number 8. Diamond Dallas Page Diamond Dallas Page 
Cage famously started his career as a professional wrestler pretty late, making his in-ring debut at the not-so-tender age of 35. Prior to lacing up his boots, however, he worked for several years as a manager and announcer for the AWA, Florida Championship Wrestling, and WCW. In 1990, Page made an appearance for WWE, driving the Rhythm and Blues tag team to the ring in his pink Cadillac at WrestleMania 6. What some people may not know is that DDP also had a tryout that year as a commentator. In some painfully awkward footage unearthed for the Hall of Famer's appearance on the Broken Skull Sessions, the wildly over the top page can be viewed doing everything in his power to animate a barely awake Lord Alfred Hayes. He didn't get the gig. The tryout was set up by Dusty Rhodes, who Dallas was good friends with. According to Page, Paul Heyman tried to smarten him up to any potential on-camera ribs beforehand, so it wouldn't have been a shock when Bruce Pritchard instructed him to pull on his own ponytail. In a great irony, WWE's production chief Kevin Dunn offered DDP an announcing gig when he was forced to temporarily retire from wrestling in 2002, though this time Page turned them down. Bang! Number 7. The American Wolves Remember when the American Wolves tag team of Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards as the American Pitbulls randomly showed up on an episode of NXT in the fall of 2013 and did a quick job for then tag team champions The Ascension? Well, there was more than meets the eye there, as their appearances were actually part of a one-week tryout at the Performance Center. WWE were in the midst of a signing spree at the time, hoovering up a lot of the prime independent and international talent that was available. Per report, Eddie was said to be the star of the tryout, which was also attended by other independent wrestlers, with Davey being the second most impressive. Not impressive enough for Paul Triple H Levesque mind, as the duo weren't offered deals. The game reportedly ordered their match with the Ascension to go home early, after Richards was accidentally dropped on his head, and when they didn't do so right away, it was considered a black mark against them. They had their supporters who vouched for them to get a chance, but Levesque remained unmoved, and the Wolves instead opted to try their luck in TNA. Number 6. Takako Inoue Considered something of a sex symbol in her native Japan during the 90s, Takako Inoue was one of the major stars of the successful All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling promotion until leaving at the end of the decade. While working as a freelancer, Inoue was invited to have a WWE tryout prior to the May 17, 2004 Raw taping. Wrestling jazz in front of agents and other decision makers before fans were let into the building the former AJW champion was described as being only okay. When she returned to Japan, she informed the press that John Laurinaitis told her that her wrestling was good, but that she needed to learn better English, so she was going to study and take classes to improve it. She also planned to go to Minnesota and train with Brad Rangans, who trained Brock Lesnar and had connections in Japan, but it was all for now, as she wouldn't be signed. Her tryout match opponent, Jazz, later admitted to getting pissed off after Takako put her in an ST Jazz's finisher at the time, and taking out her frustrations by tying the 15-year veteran in various shoot holds. Number 5. Jado and Gado in early 2007, there was something of an internal WWE push to sign some smaller international stars in order to try and recreate the mid-90s magic of WCW Nitro, as well as to outshine TNA and Wrestling Society X, who both promoted that style. Given that WWE put the Cruiserweight title on Hornswoggle that summer, you can see how that panned out. But it's the thought that counts, I suppose, and WWE at least took a look at some talents who otherwise wouldn't have been on their radar. For example, New Japan Japan Pro Wrestling's Jado and Gado, who received a tryout at the February 20th, 2007 SmackDown tapings in San Diego, California. What's interesting about this is that they were, at the time, the reigning IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. Another thing that's interesting is that their opponents weren't named in any of the reports, with their appearance being described as secretive. A sole photo of them making their entrance for it appeared in a Japanese wrestling magazine, though seemingly no footage exists. In any event, the reports also stated that WWE officials evidently weren't too impressed with the team and they ended up not getting deals. Number 4. Takeshi Morishima Takeshi Morishima was a man in demand in the mid-2000s. The hard-hitting and deceptively agile super heavyweight became a star not only in Japan for home promotion Pro Wrestling Noah, but also in the United States for Ring of Honor, reigning as the group's world heavyweight champion for a large chunk of 2007. He was 
was actually holding Noah's top prize, the GHW heavyweight title, when he wrestled two WWE dark matches at back-to-back -back TV tapings in the summer of 2008. The first night, prior to Raw, he defeated Charlie Haas at around three minutes with a top rope missile dropkick. The second night, before SmackDown and ECW, he bested Jamie Noble while being managed by Tony Atlas. Reports suggested that Morishima looked good and Noah were actually hopeful he would get signed, have a strong run, and then return to them as a bigger star to carry the company into the future. Unfortunately, Vince McMahon was unimpressed with what he saw, especially his soft physique, and outright dismissed the idea of signing him, apparently going as far to liken Morishima to former WWE flop Kenzo Suzuki, another wrestler whose signing had been pushed hard by John Laurinaitis. Number 3. Keith Lee He got there in the end, but it took Keith Lee three failed tryouts to eventually secure a WWE contract. The first one took place back in 2008 and was an eye-opening experience for the Limitless One, with Dusty Rhodes telling him that not only was he not ready, but that he flat out sucked at talking on the mic. Lee took it as a learning experience, regrouped, gained some more experience, and then came back for another shot at it in 2011. Unfortunately, he was rejected again, but was invited back once more in 2013. This tryout would take place at the newly opened Performance Center, and the big man readily admitted admitted that he was not ready for the intense conditioning drills WWE put him and the other prospects through. However, he was a much more well-rounded performer, particularly when it came to cutting promos and managed to impress the American dream this time around. Dusty even told Lee that he had a presence he could literally bask in, and thus a catchphrase was born. He was once again rejected, however, before finally being signed in 2018. Number 2. New Jack It has long been rumored that New Jack was considered as the would-be culprit in the late 2004 Who Stabbed John Cena in a Nightclub storyline. It's still mad to think that's the sort of stuff Cena was involved in before he became a day-glow merchandise machine. WWE ultimately gave the gig to our man Jesus, but decided to bring New Jack in for a look once the storyline had run its course. Invited to have a tryout slash dark match before the January 10th, 2004 Raw taping in Fort Lauderdale, the ultra-violent extremist had the dark match part nixed following an in-ring workout with Val Venus. New Jack, never one reputed for his actual wrestling ability, reportedly looked shoddy while grappling with the big Val Boski. You should have called for a toaster shot or a balcony dive, Val. According to the man himself, he also made the apparent mistake of introducing himself to Vince McMahon after road agent Dean Malenko had explicitly warned him not to. Once his name had been erased from the night's rundown, the former ECW tag team champion got his money left the arena and went to a local bar, obviously. Number 1. Eric Bischoff Eric Bischoff shocked the wrestling world when he showed up as the new Raw general manager on the July 15th, 2002 episode of WWE's flagship show. After all, this was the man who had competed in a ratings war with Vince McMahon and threatened to drive the WWE chairman out of business by any means necessary just a couple of short years prior. The sight of seeing Eazy -E not only in a WWE ring, but sharing a big hug with his former arch nemesis was akin to aliens shaking hands with the president. What people tend to forget is that Bischoff might have worked for McMahon more than a decade earlier had he passed the audition. WCW's future senior vice president went to Titan Towers in 1990 and WWE tasked the former AWA announcer to sell a broom. WWE officials evidently didn't think he did a good job of it as he wasn't hired and joined WCW months later. Eric himself later said that he was grateful for the opportunity and conceded that he wouldn't have hired him back back then either. Bischoff, mate, if you're asked to get a mop over in the future, just leave it to the pros, alright?